Sage Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and Princeton University. It's my pleasure to welcome you back to the Summer Institutes in Computational Social Science. Hello to everyone here in Princeton, hello to everyone at the partner locations, and hello to everyone tuning in on the live stream. So today we are going to learn about uh, mass collaboration, and we'll also get to participate in a mass collaboration activity. Now, thinking about mass collaborations and how they fit into, at least how I think about computational social science, so in terms of how bit by bit was organized, it was organized around a series of research designs that require more and more engagement between the researchers and the participants or the environment that the participants are interacting in. So when you observe people's behavior, as a researcher you have no control over how that data is generated. Then if you ask people questions, you have some control, but there are certain things that and there are certain things that you can learn from doing a survey that you can't learn just by watching people. Uh, but there are other things that you can't learn well from a survey. So causality is an important example. So for that reason, sometimes researchers want to exert even more control over how the data is created. And so if we are able to randomly assign people into different conditions, that enables us to learn things that are hard to learn with less intrusive research designs. So I think there, those three designs have existed for a long time in the social sciences. People did those things 50 years ago. People do them today. People will do them 50 years from now. The fourth is where we no longer think of the participants as people that we are studying, but we think of them as collaborators. <laughs> and so this enables new kinds of things where we are all working together to um, achieve something that none of us could achieve individually. So this is less common now in the social sciences, although it is common in um, some fields more than others. Uh, so in ornithology, for example, they have a long, ornithology is a study of birds. They have a long tradition of citizen science projects, also in astronomy. Uh, and I think increasingly we'll see more of this in the social sciences because the digital age enables these new kinds of collaboration. So for me, the really stunning example of this is Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is amazing. They've created this free online encyclopedia that's available to everyone in the world. And what I think is particularly amazing about Wikipedia is also that it did not require any new knowledge. All of the knowledge that was needed to create Wikipedia already existed. What was needed was a new form of collaboration. And so this might make you wonder, what are other big intellectual problems that we could solve today where all the knowledge we need already exists, but we just need new forms of collaboration? So Wikipedia is an example of what is possible if we can collaborate in a sort of digitally native way. And I think increasingly researchers will start to do that. So mass collaboration combines ideas from many different sort of communities. So one is crowdsourcing. You probably have heard some of these terms. So crowdsourcing involves taking a project, a problem, and sending it out to the crowd to have them work on it. Uh, citizen science is another related term for when citizens or non-scientists get involved in the scientific process. And collective intelligence is something that Beth Novick mentioned in her talk. It's the idea that many people working together can be somehow more intelligent than those people are individually. So mass collaboration is kind of combining ideas from all of these um, sub-communities. Um, so I like to think about there are many different ways that you can organize what the space of possible mass collaborations. Um, the way I've chosen to organize them is into three buckets. So human computation problems are those where the task is actually relatively easy, but the difficulty comes from the scale of the task. Um, so a great example of this is Galaxy Zoo, which you read about in Bit by Bit. So it's relatively easy for an, an astronomer to label a galaxy as being either spiral or elliptical, but the difficulty came because they had a million galaxies. Um, and so if you have a problem where you think, wow, if I just had a bunch of research assistants, I could do this problem, 
that's a sign that you might have a problem in a human computation space. The second space is open calls. So here, again, you're involving more people, but in a very different way. So in open call problems, it's not that you know how to do the solution and you just need help to do all of the effort. It's that you might not even know what the best solution is. So you have a clearly specified problem, but you can't generate the answer yourself. Uh, so you ask a bunch of people. And then this works best when you have answers that are easier to check than to generate. So let me give you an example of that. If I give you uh, an enormous uh, prime number, I, I give you an enormous number and I ask you to find its two prime factors, that is a very hard problem. That's like computationally very difficult. That's what a lot of our cryptography is based on. But if you give me back two prime numbers and I can then multiply them together and see if it produces the number. So generating the solution is difficult but checking the solution is easy. So there are, we are, in social sciences, I think we're not used to having problems where once we see a solution, we know it's a solution. Uh, but if we could reorient our questions such that they have clearly checkable solutions, uh, almost like a spec that you have for a piece of software, like I want this piece of software to do this, this, and this. If someone can produce the software that does those things, then you're really happy even if you don't know how to do it yourself. So then a great example of this is the Netflix prize. The people at Netflix wanted a uh, recommendation algorithm that would improve their ability to make recommendations by a specific amount. They didn't know how to generate it, but if someone else produced it, they could test it and see whether it achieved the goals that they wanted. So the third kind of mass collaboration is what I would call distributed data collection. So here, the people aren't really analyzing the data or submitting solutions to you, they're helping you collect data. And so this is very helpful in situations where you need people on widely dispersed geography or there are settings where you as a researcher are not able to safely go to the places where you would like to collect data. So we have distributed data collection now in a lot of uh, large scale surveys where we hire people to go and collect data for us. You could also imagine having volunteers or people who are participating in some other way uh, collect data for us. So an example of this is eBird, which I talked about earlier, uh, where people upload whenever they see birds, and then that creates this enormous database that can be used for ornithology research uh, and also for poachers. Um, so those are three of uh, sort of broad buckets. I like to split them up based on how uh, a lot of times a researcher would think. If a researcher thinks, oh, I wish I had a bunch of undergrad RAs, that is a clue that you might have a human computation problem. If you think, wow, I need to talk to the smartest person in the world, but I don't know who that person is. Like, I know someone has solved this problem, but I just don't know who it is. That's the kind of thing where you might have an open call problem. And if you think, I need to go out into the world and collect a bunch of new data, that's when you might have a distributed data collection problem. So the guiding idea in a lot of these mass collaborations is we want to think of the people we are working with as collaborators and not as cogs. So a lot of the computer science literature about mass collaboration, I think, treats people as a part of a larger computer program uh, and a larger system, and I think that makes sense given the background um, that computer scientists come from and how they think about the world. Uh, but I personally would like to try to think of this as a collaboration, not as people as part of a bigger machine. And again, I think there are great examples of this approach in ornithology and astronomy. So when I talk about mass collaboration, it's often the case that people are either confused or skeptical. Uh, so let me just briefly summarize some of the questions that I get and how I like to think about the answer. So one is, is this really research? So if like you're organizing a bunch of people to help do something, is that research? You're not solving the problem yourself. Someone else is doing the work or someone else is solving the problem. So I think a better question is, does this enable new research? So if by organizing a mass collaboration, you can solve a scientific problem, then I would say 
That's research because research is about solving scientific problems. This is just one method that you can use to solve them. Is this perfect? The answer is definitely no. Uh, is this better than what we can do without mass collaboration? That, I think, is the right question. So if, you can, if you're facing a problem that you can solve without a mass collaboration, then great. You should solve it yourself. Because doing a mass collaboration is really hard. But I think there are a lot of problems. And we often don't even know. We, uh, like, I think sometimes there's like this space of things that's possible. And we just don't even know it's possible, so we've never bothered to think about it. And so what I hope really is this will get you all to see new opportunities that you might not have thought were possible before. And so really, I think not, we should not ask whether this is perfect, but whether this is better than what we can do without a mass collaboration. Is this impossible uh, is another question. And I think the better answer is, is this possible? Like, what can we do? Not, let's not think about what we can't do. I mean. There are a lot of important things we can't do, but let's try to think for a minute about what we can do. So just to be clear, uh, most mass collaborations fail. I think this is a very important thing for me to say. So when I was working on Bit by Bit, I read a lot of papers. We often hear about a very small number of successful examples. And there are many, many, many more failed examples that I encountered when I was working on Bit by Bit. So, don't be fooled and think that I'm going to show you some examples. I don't want you to think, oh, wow, great. I'm going to just do this, and it's going to work. Like It's going to be hard, and a lot of these projects fail. Um, I think people are used to that a little bit in the other spaces, but I want to be sure that you know that. Because as researchers, we often know about the failures. Our friends do them. We do them ourselves. I want to be clear there's a lot of failures here, too. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them, but they're here. So I want to briefly go through each of these three types. Um, and I'm going to be pretty brief with this, because I think the, um, it's described in more detail in bit by bit. So human computation, again, these are easy task, big scale problems. These are problems where humans are better than computers. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So if you have a project where you say, wow, this is a pretty easy task. I just need some, pe some, some people to do it. I think your first question should be, can I have a computer do it? And the line between what computers can do and what people can do is moving very quickly. Um, so for example, let's say you had a huge list of numbers and you needed to add them together. You might say, oh, that's a, I'll split those numbers up. I'll have people add them up by hand, and then I'll like combine those sums and make new sums, and then I'll add up all the numbers. But there, you'd be much better working with a computer, right? And so some of the tasks related to image labeling or um, sound labeling, some of those things can be done by computers, uh, but some of them can't. And so the question is, you really want to find things that can't be done um, by computers. And, if they, and then you want to get people involved. And increasingly, we're seeing these hybrid designs where you have humans doing some parts of the work, and then you can train a machine learning model, and that machine learning model can then try to do more of the work. And in that way, with a small or medium amount of human effort, you can do labeling of enormous amounts of inputs. Um, so the line here, though, is always moving. But you want to be thinking about what should humans be doing and what should computers be doing. Um, as I said, you can now, the newer designs do a combination where you can kind of have the humans create some examples that teach the computer what to do. That doesn't always work, but it often works. And um, that's an important part of treating the human collaborators as valuable members of the team, is not wasting their time. So if there's stuff that the computer can be doing, the computer should be doing that. Um, and so I think in the social sciences in particular, this comes up more as we move towards what I would call these newer forms of data. So as social scientists, I think we're often used to working with survey data, with a rectangular data file, where there's you know, one row for each person, one column for each variable. In that kind of setting, uh, having these 
people come and annotate the data is not particularly helpful. But when you have text, images, movies, and audio, things like that, there still seems to be the case that there's stuff that people can do that computers can't do. And so as we move more and more into novel forms of data, I think this kind of design will become increasingly important. Uh, so to give an example, um, this is a paper by uh, Benoit et al. Uh, about crowdsourcing text analysis. Um, so let me just briefly uh, highlight a few things here about the abstract. Empirical social science relies on data that are not observed in the field but are transformed into quantitative variables by expert researchers who analyze and interpret qualitative raw sources. So this is what I was saying about images, text, audio. There's some raw data, and then that data is transformed usually by a coder. That coder is sometimes an expert. Um, they argue here that using experts actually is not always a feature. It's sometimes a bug. So one of the things is if you have experts, it's often hard to reproduce what you're doing to assess the test-retest reliability. Uh, also, it sometimes is difficult to go backwards in time and have those experts do something again. So let me explain that. So they were interested in these um, statements that political parties make about what their goals are. So I'm not a political scientist, so I'm going to mess up some of the details here. But political parties make these statements, and they sort of illustrate what the parties care about. And so here's an example of a manifesto from the Labour Party in the UK in 2010. Millions of people working in our public services embody the best values of Britain, helping empower people to make the most of their lives, and so on and so on and so on. So parties put out statements like this all the time, and you would imagine that political scientists would be interested in studying these statements. How do different parties talk about attitudes towards the government, for example? How does that change over time? How does that differ between parties and between countries? And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to take these sentences from these manifestos and they wanted to attach, to code it, which is another way of saying attach labels to the text. So they split and they said, is this a statement about economic policy or a statement about social policy? And then depending on which it is, is it, uh, you know, very left, somewhat left, neither left nor right, somewhat right, or very right. So these are, are labels that you want to put on these sentences. So they had experts do this task as part of a large-scale um, collaborative project. Uh, and then they also then sent this, these um, sentences to people on a service similar to Mechanical Turk. So these are the results. So for the economic, so on, on your left is the manifesto placement for economic things. So the x-axis is the expert coding about far, you know, far to the left, center, or far to the right. And the y-axis is the crowd coding. And so what you see is they line up quite well. So in other words, the crowd is able to reproduce the experts in a setting where there is an expert measurement. And you see a similar thing for social placement. And you'll see also that this applies. The colors indicate which uh, political party, I believe, and the numbers indicate what year. So you see that this is not a fluke to, let's say, one particular party in one particular year. It seems to be a pretty general pattern. So again, as we've talked about a couple times, when you have a new measurement technique, you often want to validate it against some other measurement that's already happened. That's what this is. But then they show that you can also then do measurements that hadn't been made previously. So for example, when this research project started in the, I believe it was the 80s, immigration was not a major issue in Europe. It has since become a major issue. They can't go back and find those experts who coded the thing, the earlier manifestos. So then they try to code them uh, through this crowd coding process. And then that allows them to make a new measurement, which they couldn't make if they were continuing to use the expert process. So what I like a lot about this paper is that the focus on the mass collaboration is about better data and not cheaper data. Often we hear, oh, let's just put it on Mechanical Turk. That will save a lot of money. 
Uh, someone in Slack posted a good article about what it's like being a worker on Mechanical Turk and the challenges involved in that. Um, so I think just cutting costs, even though I've said before cutting costs is important, uh, I think we also want to think about not just cheaper but also better when it's possible. So here we can, because it's easy to reproduce these results, uh, to collect the data, they actually like reproduce their own results and show that the results are similar if you do this process one day and then you do it a few months later, which is great. And then they show you're able to make these measurements you're not able to make in an expert way. So experts are a bug and not a feature. So if you're in a situation where you're, you need experts, just think for a second, like, what if experts are really bad? What if we want a different thing? What, what are the downsides that come from working with experts? What would be the upsides that could come if we could do some more of a human computation type system? So any questions about uh, mass, uh, human computation? Then I'll go through each of the three types. That was the first of the three. OK. Yes. So, uh, and yesterday we were paying for $50 an hour. Yep. And my, what my impression of the field is most people pay a lot less. Yep. And I just wonder if you can speak to that. Sure. So let me, re I'll repeat the question and then we'll start passing the microphone. So the uh, question was about the ethics of payment on MTurk. So yesterday we decided that we wanted to pay $15 an hour. Um, many people pay less than that. Um, I think. This is a question that goes back to something we talked about on the first day with ethics about how much money is the right amount of money. I think each individual researcher has to decide for himself or herself uh, what it is that they want to do. And I would just urge people to, at a minimum, think about it. At a minimum, figure out how much time it takes to do the task that you're doing. Multiply that out into an hourly rate and decide if you think that is a reasonable hourly rate. Um, I think, and, and you know, there's, that's all I guess I would like to say about that. Um, if people, there's an article in the Slack, if people want to repost that, I think it might be, people might be interested. Yeah? Well. Are there times um, where experts might be needed? So I'll, I'll give you an example. So I'm in, in my work specifically, we hire formerly Gang Evolve youth to interpret tweets. And we've compared those with kind of MSW students, but also violence prevention workers. Mm -hmm. And so to see the kind of differences in the possible problems with not having mm -hmm. experts involved. And so I guess I, I, I see the example here of where experts may not be needed or may mm -hmm. actually be a problem. Are there, are there other examples where you may actually need experts to, to get that kind of um, possibly golden code? Or yeah. So I think that this is a great question. I think your work is a great example of where experts are needed, but those experts aren't necessarily what many people often think of when they think of experts. Um, so I might encourage people to not just think about whether experts are bugs or features, but also think about who are really experts. Um, and um, if you want to post that paper in Slack, I think people would be really interested, because I think it is a great example of um, finding the right experts for a specific um, task. Uh, do you have any experience uh, calculator the inter-observer agreement when you have a uh, human uh, expert coding the data? Because, yeah. for example, when you work with 10 people, it could be easy, but when you work with 10 hundred, I don't know. Yeah, so this is a great question about inner coder reliability. I personally don't have a lot of experience with it. I do want to clarify, though, that these estimates, for example, these come out of a complicated model that tries to figure out which coders seem to line up better with which other coders. And like, there's a, I think if your idea is you're going to put it out there and one, you're going to get an evaluation from one person and that's going to, then you're going to, that's going to be a result, that's a bad idea. 
uh, I think you need to get many, many people to, to assess it, and then you need to combine that information from those people in a sensible way. This paper has one particular way of doing that. I know there's also a lot of research in the collective intelligence field about different ways of trying to find uh, workers that give accurate answers, combine those answers in efficient ways, and so on. But I think it is a very important point that when you move away from uh, experts or people who actually are deeply engaged in what you're doing and you move to people who are doing what you're doing for money, sometimes the engagement and attention to detail can go down. That's one of the other reasons why I like to think of people as collaborators because if you set up a system that people want to participate in, then I think you're more likely to get better data. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving to the next part so we have some time. We'll have another moment for questions at the end of the open call section. So open calls. So one of my favorite examples of an open call is this uh, book, Longitude. How many people have read this book? Oh, it's a really good book. Um, so basically, it's about the, um, the British Navy in the 1700s or 1600s wanted a way to figure out where a ship was at sea, its longitude. And like they didn't have GPS back then. And so at the time, many of the most famous scientists in Britain thought that the solution would be an astronomical solution. So somehow you would look at the sky and take some kind of measurements and that would be able to tell you where you were at sea. And people like Isaac Newton and Edmund Haley we're working on that kind of solution. Um, and so the, the UK government said, or the British government said, we're gonna have a prize. Anyone who can figure out how to do this will give them an enormous amount of money because it's extremely important militarily and commercially because other, otherwise ships were really just getting lost out there. And it turned out that um, there was a clockmaker who no one, had ever heard of who was not Isaac Newton or Edmund Haley. Uh, and he had this idea that somehow if you could build a clock that was able to keep time successfully while you're on the ocean, this would allow you to figure out your longitude. So I'm not an astronomer, I can't explain that. Uh, but at the time, clocks were very um, unreliable and would not work well in an environment where you're up and down and with a lot of humidity. And so he figured out how to build a seafaring clock, uh, which enabled them to solve this problem. And then, the, UK, then the, the parliament did not want to give him the prize. So he had to do it again, and he had to do it again. Um, so what I love about this story is, one, they posed the question that they had in a way that it was clear that someone doing something different could still win. Right? That made them open to new ideas. And then this person that they didn't expect had a new idea and enabled them to solve the problem better than the way the people, the experts had thought previously. So here, again, solutions are easier to check than to generate. That is a key property of these open call problems. Uh, and you all will participate in an open call in a few minutes. So are there any questions about open calls? Yeah? He did eventually get the prize, uh, but it took a lot of work uh, for him to get it. Other questions? Okay. So let's go now to the third kind of mass computation, or uh, mass collaboration is distributed data collection. So in this case, you want people to be out helping you collect data. Sometimes it's not clear where the line is between human computation and distributed data collection. So for example, you might say that in the um, case that we saw where you have these snippets of text and people are annotating them, you might say that's distributed data collection. So I would, I would, I'm gonna show you a different example that I think illustrates what I think is the difference. So I think one is you have the data already and you're just sort of annotating that data versus you, you have to go out in the world and collect new stimuli. 
So this is really helpful where people, people can be where researchers can't. There's some examples of research done in, for example, conflict zones where researchers cannot safely go there, but people who live there can. Well, not, they're not safe either. They're more safe than researchers uh, and can contribute to data collection in that way. Um, and it also scales in ways that individual researchers cannot. So the, as I said, some of the earliest examples of this were in ornithology. And that's because if you want to study bird migration, that is not something that any one individual researcher can do. It requires people who are distributed over time and space. And so ornithologists have developed the traditions and customs necessary to do that. And I think other pe we could imagine other problems like bird migration where having people working together over time and space can help. Uh, so an example of a project I really like is Photo City. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about this project. So this paper um, is an amazing example of what you can do with ready-made data. So they scraped the photos, a photo site, I believe it was Flickr, and took all the pictures that people took of places in Rome. So this is all the photos that people took of the Colosseum and posted on Flickr. And then they were able to create a 3D reconstruction of the Colosseum. And so by stitching these photos together. And you can see these triangles at the bottom are the placements of people taking their pictures. So one of the things that they noticed is that many people seem to take essentially the exact same picture of the Colosseum. Um, and so that left, so for certain parts of the Colosseum, they can get great coverage. For other parts, the coverage is very poor. And so they needed to come up with a way of having people take pictures of the entire building, not just the one kind of shot that you would want to see in a postcard. So they created a game to get, uh, to enable people to take pictures of buildings at the University of Washington and Cornell University. And so I'm not going to explain exactly how the game worked, but you can see it is definitely designed to be an enjoyable game-like experience. Um, and over two months, they had 45 players submit about 10,000 photos. And then those are the reconstructions of the buildings. So I have seen Sage Chapel and Uris Library at Cornell. And I think that looks like this. And you can also see that they have, <coughs> in, the, in the website, you can sort of go all around the building because it's been completely captured, not just the cool looking parts. So what I love about this paper is the way the design solves a lot of different problems. So first is the data collection is standardized because of the use of cameras. So let me just briefly explain how this problem arises in other settings. So in eBird, for example, this is the bird uploading site. It turns out that some people are better at identifying birds than other people. And so a huge problem they have is misidentification. And they don't know how much misidentification is happening. So in Photo City, though, they've like, de-skilled and standardized the way the data is captured. And so this enables them to not have to worry as much about different levels of quality among the different data collectors. The second problem that this solves really nicely is verification. So another problem with eBird is, let's say I upload that I saw a bald eagle here in Princeton. So was there actually a bald eagle here in Princeton? I don't know. I don't even know if it's possible for there to be a bald eagle in <laughs> Princeton. Um, it is true that, so they do have checks that they do to make sure, like if I say that there's a bird here that only lives in Antarctica, that would be captured by their filter. But if I say that I observe a rare species that actually could be where I am, it's hard for them to know whether that's real or not real. And so here, the way the verification happens is when I upload a picture to Photo City, it matches that picture against existing pictures that it already has of the building. And if there's an overlap, then it accepts this picture. And if there's not, it doesn't. It says, I don't know if that's really the right building. 
I'm not going to include that picture. So it has this very nice mechanism for verifying the data that's coming in, and that's a key problem you'll have to solve with a distributed data collection system. The other thing is it does a great job of training people to collect valuable data. So the number of points that it gives you is related to the number of new pixels that you are adding to the image. And so one of the problems with distributed data collection, again going back to eBird, in eBird almost all of the birds they see are near roads. And that is because most of the people who participate in eBird are near roads. And there are large parts of the world where birds are, there are not roads, and those birds are never captured. So, it's a, so an eBird, it's lovely, it's great, people upload wherever they are. You would like some way to encourage people to steer people towards the data that is more helpful. And so they do that really nicely by giving more points depending on how much you add to the um, overall model reconstruction. So I really love, and th these are problems that you will generally need to solve if you try to have a distributed data collection system. You will need to deal with non-standardization at different levels of skill. You will need to deal with verification, and you will need to deal with training or steering the people towards the kind of data that you want. So I think this does a great job of solving a lot of problems. So are there any questions about distributed data collection or mass collaboration more generally? So this is going to be the end of the kind of overview. And then after this, we're going to jump right into a specific mass collaboration. So I want to stop for a second and see if there are any questions. Okay. Can we pass the mic? Hi, I think that you might be covering this in the, in the um, after this, but um, just, I'm just pulling this question. So I'm mostly doing historical sort of science, and most of the time we uh, scan the da uh, archival data and then and like trying to transcribe it using OCR and other technologies, but sometimes the quality is not good. And I wonder whether there's any way like using students or outside a participant to you know, annotate the doc, uh, archival material. Yes, absolutely. So there is a project called uh, Zooniverse. So the Galaxy Zoo people, the team that did Galaxy Zoo, they then generalized their thing. So they said, any kind of input that we want labels for, we can create a system that will support that. So they do have a number. Of, here's an example of a handwriting challenge. These are old documents from Shakespeare uh, that they ask volunteers to come and transcribe. So if you have this problem, you can potentially, um, so I think the way it works is you have to pitch what you want to do to the Zoo Universe team. And if they think the problem is going to be sufficiently interesting for their community, then they will potentially allow it to be on your site. But you'll notice that everyone who is working on this site is a volunteer. And so they, the problem has to be sufficiently interesting. Like this is like a, they don't just say, here's a little piece. Like they explain to you why this is important. They get you excited about the problem. And um, so that, that is definitely something that, that has been done and could be done. Other questions? To ask, are there any studies about who participated in these uh, mass collaborations? Because uh, what people do, how they like, code something or evaluate something, can influence the results. Yeah. So there are questions about who participate. There are there are some studies. Um, my sense of it is, it seems to vary a huge amount from project to project, um, depending on what reasons people have for wanting to participate. So sometimes people want to participate. I think one very simple way to separate, sometimes people want to tr participate for intrinsic reasons, like they just enjoy Shakespeare and they want to help science. Sometimes they participate for rewards, like money or uh, status. Sometimes they participate to be part of a community. 
which is kind of an in-between thing. Um, but I think an important thing you also mentioned was how is who is participating impacting what you are learning? And I think that is very important to remember, again, that the people, who, for example, especially when the people are doing labeling of images or text, that that is not, that the labels people provide depend on who those people are. So what someone might think of as an aggressive discussion between a police officer and a citizen might vary from person to person. And so you'll need to think about who these people are as they're doing the annotations because that's going to impact the data that you have. Which I think is different from settings where it's like, is this picture a cat or is this picture not a cat? Like, we all kind of agree. But for a lot of the problems in the social sciences, I think there's, there are legitimate differences. There is no right answer. Other questions? Okay, I'll pass the mic back to Tom.